Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the caregiver webinar series. Today's topic will be post adoption support. This webinar series is brought to you by the California Department of Social Services in partnership with the California Alliance of Caregivers. Some logistics for this webinar is that this webinar is being recorded and will be available at www.cacaregivers.org forward slash webinars. If you would like a certificate of attendance, please email your request to info at cacaregivers.org as listed in the chat. Participants will not have the ability to speak, so please submit questions to the Q&A section of the toolbar. It is the icon with the three dots that should give you this option. So for our agenda, my name is Tremaine Palmer and I'm with CDSS and the Foster Caregiver Policy and Support Unit. And we have the caregiver perspective, which is going to be by Jennifer Rexroad. She is the executive director of the California Alliance of Caregivers. And today for our topic, post-adoption support, we will have our speakers, Colin Williams, who will be speaking on the Family Urgent Response System, and he uh, is with CDSS as well, as well as Marta Platt and Olga Gonzalez. They are from the Adoptions Policy Unit at CDSS, and they will be speaking on post-adoption support as well. Uh, our last speaker, Whitney Robertson, uh, the director of Think of Us, will also be sharing some information on post-adoption support. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, send it off to Jennifer Rexroad for the caregiver perspective. Thank you, Tremaine. California Alliance of Caregivers um, represents the voices of relative and non-relative caregivers to promote the well-being of children in foster care. And we provide advocacy support in information and resources for foster adoptive guardian and kinship families. And what we have found out um, more recently, especially during the pandemic, um, are there are many adoptive families who um, have been somewhat disconnected to the supports of the child welfare system um, as they've um, completed their adoption. They're, they're not connected um, with the agency or social workers as much anymore. Um, they've they've begun their adoption journey, and and oftentimes when they run into um, some challenges, um, they feel somewhat disconnected to the supports that they had um, when they were fostering or when their um, children first entered their homes. And so oftentimes getting connected back into available resources um, can be challenging. And so we thought it would be great to um, reconnect um, adoptive families with some new resources that are available, including the um, Family Urgent Response System um, of which they're eligible, and also the California Kinship Navigator. And so, um, as with children who are currently in the child welfare system, we want them to be connected to the support and resources they need um, for placement stability. Likewise, as children are continuing to develop and grow, we want them to have all of the services and supports they need to continue to thrive. And we're hoping that um, representatives from um, from the state and um, think of us can share um, share some of these valuable um, resources that are available um, to support kids and families. So with that, I will introduce um, our first speaker, um, Colin, from um, representing the Family Urgent Response System. Um, we're so. Um, so excited to have been um, part of um, advocating for this program to um, come to fruition several years ago and um, to be a part of the developing program and are just really excited about the potential um, that it that it has um, to support children and families. So Colin, um, here's the mic. 
Thank you. Um, as stated, my name is Colin Williams. I'm an analyst with the California Department of Social Services uh, in the Placement Services and Support Unit. Uh, we're the unit responsible for the oversight and implementation for the first program. A presentation that I will bring up now. Okay. So there's a lot of information to cover, so I'm going to get right into it. Um, some of you may have heard of the Family Urgent Response System, or for short, FERS, uh, but you may not have been aware that it is uh, that children who have exited foster care into adoption are part of the eligible population. So uh, for those of you who are aware, this will be kind of a, a reintroduction of the program. For those of you who aren't familiar with the program, Welcome to FERS. Uh, so FERS was created to provide current and former foster youth and their caregivers with immediate trauma-informed support when they need it. Uh, it consists of state and local components, a statewide hotline that's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, and they respond to caregiver or youth um, during situations of instability over their hotline. And it also consists of um, corresponding county-based mobile response and stabilization teams that are also available 24-7, 365. And this is in every county to provide in-person support. Uh, the goals for the first program are to prevent placement disruptions and preserve relationships between caregivers and children or youth. Uh, it, is intended to prevent 911 calls or law enforcement involvement and the needless criminalization of traumatized youth, to prevent hospitalization and placement into congregate care, to promote healing as a family, and mostly to promote uh, stability for youth currently or formerly in foster care, including youth in extended foster care. Um, I worked as a social worker in one of the counties and one of the most disruptive things to a case was when a placement was likely to be lost. Um, finding a new placement for that youth was often difficult. Transitioning that youth to a new placement and making sure all their services and supports were able to carry over with them was immensely difficult and uh, traumatic to the youth and to the, the family that we were working with. And so the idea behind FERS is to uh, limit the times that that's occurring from foster placements and from post foster placements as well, including adoption. Uh, and the FERS program also wants to connect families to ongoing resources in their communities. Uh, FERS is a short term uh, intervention that connects to long, -to long term supportive services in the community. Uh, some intent items uh, we want to be able to address the immediate need. So FERS uh, is creating a new robust resource to provide immediate trauma-informed support. Uh, again, going back to my time as a social worker, something would be going on in the home that would require some uh, attention. And as a social worker, I would make a referral. The referral would get processed. It would go to a service provider and they would do an intake session and then services would happen. And it, that process could take very, very long. And so first, we want to kind of cut all of that out. Not to say that, that uh, those long-term services aren't important, but to create a situation of immediate attention to uh, an issue before it escalates into a, a greater issue. We want to make sure that the program is user-driven. We put families and children in the driver's seat. Uh, this is a voluntary program, so we don't have anyone calling on behalf of a family saying, hey, this family needs services unless the family has requested someone to help them make that call. Uh, youth and caregivers determine when they require immediate support, not a professional. It's a coordinated service. Uh, it breaks down silos between child serving systems. Uh, we've created a network of communication and cooperation between child welfare agencies, probation agencies, and uh, behavioral health. And the intent of the first program is to provide support, provide support for situations of instability that include, but are not limited to mental health crises. So a big question, who does first serve? 
Uh, our definition of current or former foster youth includes uh, a child or youth adjudicated under Welfare and Institutions Code 300, which is Child Welfare, uh, 601 or 602, which are our probation codes, and who is served by a county child welfare agency or probation department. It includes a child or youth who has exited foster care to reunification, guardianship, emancipation, or adoption. It also includes uh, these youth until they reach age 21. Uh, there is a Senate bill that is currently in place, um, kind of coming down the home stretch, that will include uh, youth who are in voluntary placement agreements, um, youth who are placed out of home but have not yet received a 300 ruling. Um, I'm not going to spend time <laughs> on that. Um, and children or youth who are placed in California uh, by way of the interstate compact placement of children. So this is the potential future prefers. Um, this is a bill that is publicly available and is being considered uh, right now. Caregiver is defined broadly for the purposes of FERS to include individuals in a caregiving role. So this is foster parents, this is adoptive parents, this is biological parents who a, children, who a child has reunified to. These are all eligible populations. FERS is available during situations of instability as defined by the child, youth, or care, caregiver. And so in our outreach, we have made a, a strong point of saying that Situations of instability, it doesn't mean that it has to rise to traditional levels of uh, needing intervention. One of our early success stories is about a family conflict where a youth just wouldn't eat their vegetables. Uh, and where normally that wouldn't dictate any sort of therapeutic or behavioral support response, uh, the first team was able to provide some intervention in that case. Um, because we knew that the tension that was developing from that situation could escalate into a situation that could lead to a, a failure of placement. So the first team was able to intervene and create some stability in that situation. The CalPERS statewide hotline is operated by Sacramento Children's Home. They are the vendor for that. Um, their number is one eight three three nine three nine three eight seven seven, and you can reach that number by call or text. Um, they've found that a lot of their youth interactions are through text, uh, and they are pretty successful at transitioning those into phone calls if there's a need for uh, more intense support. And then there's also the CalFERS website, cal excuse me, cal-furs.org. And they have a chat feature on their website, again, popular with their youth interactions, um, where you can reach for help by that method. As stated, this hotline and the website support are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week to support caregivers or current and former uh, foster children or youth uh, during situations of instability. It's staffed by caring counselors trained in conflict resolution and de-escalation for children and youth impacted by trauma. So it's very trauma-informed. Uh, counselors are a mix of professionals and paraprofessionals. Um, through all stages of the FERS program, we have been emphasizing the use of peer partners, um, both parent partners, and then where appropriate uh, youth partners to be able to interject uh, lived experience into um, providing that support. Uh, and as I said, uh, this is a contracted service with Sacramento Children's Home. So anyone who calls CalFERS will receive phone, text, or live chat support, even if they're not eligible uh, for those that call or type text uh, who aren't eligible. The CalFERS team maintains a very large library of local resources. So for ineligible callers, they can kind of isolate where that caller is coming from uh, through engaging with the caller and find local resources for them to connect with. Uh, in the case of um, youth or 
caregivers who are eligible, then the hotline can engage those families. I mean, use families as a shorthand for children, youth, and caregivers sometimes because it's just easier. Um, and when providing the, those services, the CalFIRST hotline will then follow up uh, 24 hours later to determine if there's uh, any additional need. Um, for FERS eligible callers, hotline staff will make a referral to a county-based mobile response system for in-person responses when desired by the caller. So uh, someone can call the FERS hotline. If they're an eligible caller, they can then request that instead of engaging by phone, that they have an in-person response. Or the CalFERS team, the hotline, can determine if the family is in need of a higher level of support, they can make a uh, recommendation for it to go to an in-person team, and the family can choose to accept that recommendation or decline. It's their choice, very user-driven. And so if it is going to continue to an in-person response, then what is initiated is a warm handoff where the hotline determines the uh, mobile response in the county that the family is calling from, where they are currently located. It does not have to be the county that the family is receiving services through or has jurisdiction by. So the hotline will contact the county that the family is located in with the family on the line and they will coordinate the response. All mobile responses are considered urgent unless the caller requests scheduling a response at a specific time. So our definition of urgent and non-urgent is different from traditional child welfare. Um, for our urgent responses, the required timing for a response is within one hour, but not to exceed three hours. We understand that some counties are very large geographically or just have uh, an urban density that requires a lot of time to get from one place to another. So that one to three hours is, is the, the set uh, response time. If a family says, you know, we, we acknowledge the need for some help, but we really, we wanna make sure that we have some support people who are able to attend, or there's some family members who aren't currently home who should attend, or there's some things that we would like to do to prepare, or if this call is in anticipation of some sort of transition where we know that there's gonna be tension and we want support for then, those are non-urgent responses, and those can occur within 24 hours after a phone call is made. Our county mobile response systems are uh, consists of county child welfare, probation, and behavioral health agencies. Uh, they were required to develop county-based mobile response system plans in all uh, 58 counties across the state. Uh, counties had flexibility in how they were going to set up their, their programs. A number of counties have contracted these services to community-based uh, service providers, and then some counties are operating their mobile response uh, internally based off of their um, child welfare, probation, and behavioral health uh, staff and support. Um, but in any case, these multiple multidisciplinary teams um, may be composed of people such as licensed clinicians, case managers, peer partners, and resource coordinators who have all received specialized training in trauma and the foster care system. Those are the big ones. Uh, and same as with the hotline, we've encouraged uh, the use of peer partners at the county mobile response level uh, to be able to interject that lived experience when providing support. Uh, for mobile response coordination, uh, they must have a process for identifying any existing child and family teams, CFTs, behavioral health treatment plans, and or placement preservation strategies that exist. We don't want to rewrite all of these plans that are already in place, and so we want the mobile response teams to be adapt or adept at uh, identifying where these plans exist and help facilitate those, those plans and utilize those existing support structures. Mobile response services are provided by the county the caller is currently located in, which may differ from the county of jurisdiction. For 
youth that are currently in foster care and have an open case. The team must also communicate with the county of jurisdiction and the county behavioral health agency regarding the service needs of the child or youth or caregiver. So if a mobile response provides service to a youth who is uh, under the jurisdiction of a different county, they are required to communicate that a response occurred to that county and um, let them know what sort of service recommendations came about and what the strengths and needs were um, and the like. Here's some data from our past operating year. Um, our full program launch was in July of 2021. Um, and so, as you can see, there's a steady increase in the number of calls that have come to the hotline uh, with a corresponding uh, rate of calls going to mobile response. Uh, our current rate of calls that go to mobile response is probably about 32 to 33%. And that's been holding pretty steadily. Uh, at the state level, we have developed some outreach materials. Uh, we have a set of materials that are geared towards youth, and then we have a set that are geared towards caregivers. We wanted to be very deliberate in this approach uh, because we understand that these different groups have different needs, uh, different, different needs. Um, so we wanted to communicate with the youth that FERS is a positive resource that you can call for things big and small. It's a judgment-free and safe resource, and it's a space for youth to feel heard and understood by a neutral party. We're not here to take sides. This and our other outreach materials are available on our CDSS uh, FERS outreach website. We have a website with these materials. These flyers have been translated into, I think, eight different languages. And we have an ordering form that's available on that website. Um, I can drop a link after I'm done presenting uh, directly to it in the chat or in Q&A, wherever it'll be seen. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, there's, where was I? There's an ordering form, sorry. <laughs> And uh, if you reach out to your local child welfare agency, they can uh, make a um, request on your behalf because it's we make those available to the child welfare agencies in each county and no charge. But if you are uh, not a direct county entity, then you'll need to go through your child welfare agency to make that order. For our caregivers, we also wanted to identify that reaching out for help is a sign of strength. FERS is here to support you, you're not alone. FERS is here to support placements and preserve relationships. And it's an opportunity to speak with a neutral party. And I think the one that we wanna emphasize really a lot with this is reaching out for help as a sign of strength. We heard early on in the planning process and development that caregivers were worried that if they were utilizing this service that it would see be seen as uh, negative, like they weren't able to maintain the stability of the placement on their own. Um, but we would much rather them ask for help, be able to identify when they need help, ask for help, than for the placement to be lost. All right, got through. There's questions and answers, and I'm gonna put up the resource page in the meantime, so that people can see that. And if there's any questions, I, I will gladly answer them. Participants can put their questions in the Q&A section, and we're also watching the chat, but it's, it's best if you um, can find the Q&A section and, um, and type your question in there. I, I will say, while we wait for potential questions, uh, we did get a success story recently from San Joaquin County. There was a youth who is in, in an adoptive placement 
uh, she had ran away due to some due to some tensions with her caregiver. She had been um, unable to be found for a little while, and was found uh, back with her bio mom. Uh, she had some pretty significant health needs, um, or excuse me, not health needs, hygiene needs that needed to be addressed. Um, with the help of the FERS team, they were able to uh, come up with a plan for her to transition back into her adoptive home. And then also as kind of a, a hand holding to that, to help her be set up with some uh, behavioral support that she was in need of. Um, so then she was signed up for therapeutic behavior services um, and then some other mental health supports that the family wasn't quite aware of, of what she was needing. And so the adoptive parents also received some, some caregiver education as part of the first intervention. Um, and then the youth had messaged the first team a few days later, uh, just really thanking them for their support. She, she hadn't felt supported prior to that, and she had difficulty expressing her needs and the first team was able to step in and, and support the family as a, as a unit in uh, attending to what she was needing. Trying to see the message in the chat, but it's not letting me expand the box. There we go. Are there any trends that you've seen from the phone calls, such as supports that are generally lacking across the child welfare system? or common flashpoints between caregivers and kids? Uh, that's a great question. Um, we have seen um, trend-wise, unfortunately, one of the trends that we've seen is um, just the very strong need for uh, mental health supports for our youth. Um, much greater than we would have anticipated, especially in the realm of uh, suicidal ideation. Uh, a number of these uh, calls that we get are, are youth who are struggling with that. Uh, thankfully, the FERS program has been able to intervene in a number of these cases, uh, whereas normally this would go to, you know, like a 5150 uh, hospitalization. And so we are being able to step in early into that process before it escalates to that point of needing that very intense service and uh, connecting youth to, to mental health supports. That's one of the bigger trends that we've seen uh, coming through the data. Thank you, Colin. This is, I love, I love the stories that you share and I'm really, really excited to hear about um, those families receiving that support. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, present to this group. Um, we, you know, we're in a, a year into this program and we are trying to do whatever we can to get the word out. Um, we, we find that we have like our higher level resources, but the best way that we can get that information out is to get the information to people who are in the counties doing the work. And so we we implore you to let people know about this resource, uh, kind of shout it from the rooftops, uh, let them know that this is a program that's available for, um, for adoptive youth, for uh, caregivers who are uh, providing an adoptive home. Um, if, a, if a youth has spent any time in foster care, they are eligible for the most part uh, for this service. And it will follow them uh, out of foster care and up until the age of 21. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Colin, for that information today. Uh, were there any other questions for Colin in the chat, Jen? No, it, it looks like we, we don't have any more questions. Perfect. Well, then we're going to move on to our next speakers, and that's going to be Marta and Olga, and they are with the Adoptions Policy Unit. So, Marta and Olga, feel free to take it away. 
Thank you. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Um, so hello everyone. My name is Olga Gonzalez and I'm an analyst with the Adoption Services Branch and uh, Marta Platt is going to be presenting with me today. We're going to be talking about post-adoption services. Um, so um, we're going to be talking about supportive services for adoptive families, including the Adoption Assistance Program. And um, in our branch, we also consider post-adoption services the facilitation of contact between parties of an adoption and release of adoption information. So I'm actually going to start talking about um, that second bullet first, facilitation of contact between parties and release of adoption um, records and information. Um, I'm going to go really briefly through it because um, this, these services are usually requested down the road when an adult is, I'm sorry, an adoptee is an adult and wants to connect with their birth family. Um, and so it may not pertain to the families, um, you know, that have just adopted or are planning to adopt, but I think it's still good information to have or keep in mind. Um, so we have some mutual registry programs. We have two forms. Um, one is the consent to arrange contact form. And when an adoptee and a birth parent signs the form and files it with us or with the agency that completed the adoption, that gives the agency the ability to share contact information between them so that they can contact each other. Um, and likewise, we have the waivers of rights to confidentiality for siblings form. So um, when two siblings complete this form, we can provide them their information so that they can contact each other. Um, this may pertain more to the families that we're working with because um, an adoptive parent who has a minor child and wants to um, look for a sibling, establish contact with that sibling, can use a version of this form to do that. And we do have adoptive parents that call us and want to, you know, want some help with that process. Um, and then for siblings, um, there is also the um, possibility to get a confidential intermediary assigned. So they have to petition the court for this, um, but a confidential intermediary is someone that will look for a sibling. Say, they, um, say the first sibling submitted the waiver form, but the other one has not. So the confidential intermediary will um, actively search and um, for that other sibling and ask them if they want to um, sign the waiver. Um, so that is something that, you know, a lot of a lot of um, adult adoptees and also adoptive parents with minor children um, seek to do. And then um, so we hold uh, adoption records for all of California, and although we cannot release actual records, only the court can do that. We can release some information to different parties of an adoption. So adult adoptees can request non-identifying information about their birth parents. Birth parents can request non-identifying information about adoptive parents. And then we can release medical information to adult adoptees, adoptive parents, and children of adoptees. Um, actual medical reports can only be, gi be given to adoptees. Um, and then to all other parties, we can provide a written summary of any medical information that's in the file. Um, and then, like I said, any other records, original birth certificates or documents from the court file, from the actual adoption file uh, must be obtained by, the, by petitioning the court. And that's the court where um, the adoption finalized or where the petitioner resides if it's in California. Um, so again, most of these services are requested later on, um, but I hope that this information is helpful. Um, I'll take any questions and then turn it over to Marta, who will talk about the other supportive services and AAP.
I'm not able to see if there are any questions. Can someone let me know if there's any in the chat or the Q and A? I do not see any questions in the chat or the Q and A. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'll um, pass it over to Marta. Thank you, Olga. Hi, my name is Marta Platt. I'm with the Adop Adoption Services Branch and I work with Olga. And um, so for post adoption services, all post adoption services funding was realigned to the counties in 2011. So the scope of services provided varies from county to county. Um, availability of services depends on the county the child was dependent of prior to the adoption and finalization. I have been hearing recently that a few counties across the state have started to contract with private agencies and it might actually be related to first, but also I think the, the counties are also contracting with the private agencies to provide post adoption services as well. So I don't think I can change the slide. Olga? I'll change it. Thank you. <laughs> so, if the child was a dependent of one of the following county services, post adoption services by, are provided by the department through a private agency contractor. So children who were adopted from Madera, Mariposa, Mono, and San Benito, the private contractor is a Spirinet. So the parents would not need to, would need to contact that agency to obtain post adoption services if they've, if their child was a dependent of the, one of those counties. The other contractor is Wayfinder Family Services. They serve Amador, Calaveras, Calusa, Del Norte, Glen, Lake, Lassen, Mendocino, Modoc, Napa, Siskiyou, Sierra, Sutter, Trinity, and Yolo, and Yuba. So Wayfinder Family, Wayfinder Family Services provides post adoption services for those children adopted from those counties. The services provided are crisis intervention and therapeutic in nature, information listings for local therapists and referral services. I know that Wayfinder has been very, um, very much an advocate in trying to obtain, uh, in providing adoption competent um, trainings for therapists within all the local local counties, um, counties throughout the state actually. So. Um, adoption competent therapists, I think that pop, that niche is starting to increase um, and become more read readily available to families. Um, other services include children's support groups, parent training and support groups, family community activities and events, um, respite de development, peer support networks, informational newsletters, um, in addition to those services, there is limited financial sponsorships for family supports and extraordinary needs. There's also limited financial sponsorship, sponsorship and provision for family and child enrichment activities. So, and the other thing to keep in mind with the SpiritNet and Wayfinder Family Services, they do provide post adoption service to, services to other counties throughout the state. Um, you would need to contact those agencies to um, find out which counties those are. But I know that they have contracts outside of um, CDSS that they do provide post adoption services. So. Next, okay. So we're moving on to AAP, the Adoption Assistance Program. AAP is simply a funding source. Um, it's a financial, it provides financial and medical assistance for um, primarily for children who have been in the foster care system and it helps with uh, the adoption process and maintaining the adoption home. So part of the benefits of um, AAP is that there's a monthly negotiated rate, medical coverage, Medi-Cal here in California, if they move out of state would be typically as Medicaid, um, payment for eligible out-of-home placements, which would be a 24-hour therapeutic residential treatment program payment for eligible wraparound services. Um, AAP may continue regardless of the adoptive family state or country of residence. If the family does move out of the country, um, they will need to obtain their own medical coverage because Medi-Cal and Medicaid is specific to, US, to the US, but um, they, 
they can certainly continue to receive that monthly negotiated rate. And then if eligible, AAP benefits may continue to the age of 21. Um, so a few things to keep in mind with AAP. The intent of AAP benefits is to assist adopted parents with their child's lifelong needs. Adopted parents are responsible for any extra costs that exceed the negotiated AAP rate. Um, there is a limit to AAP benefits. The negotiated AAP ben benefit is based on the child's care and supervision needs and the circumstances of a family. Um, and then the AAP benefit does not include payment for any specific goods or services or expenses over and above the costs associated with the child's care and supervision needs. Goods and services would include costs related to, but not limited to like travel, childcare, clothing, shoes, toiletries, therapy, therapy, um, medication, respite care, food, specialized medical equipment and or services and educational costs such as private school, admission or tutoring. Um, So, and then lastly, um, adoptive parents need to work directly with the responsible public agency, that would be the county or the department they signed the AAP agreement with to renegotiate rates and um, to discuss increases, rate increases and eligibility criteria for payments for out-of-home placements and wraparound services. So, I believe that is, it for my um yes <laughs> so my contact is marta platt at dss.ca.gov also you're welcome to send specific emails aap related emails to the aap mailbox which is aap at dss.ca.gov and then olga um, gonzalez her email information is provided as well so questions so I did forget a P in your last name on the email address, so. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's all right. Were there any questions in the chat or the Q&A section for uh, Marta and Olga Jen? I don't see any, but one question that we also or we often um, receive is when adoptive parents don't know who their uh, their adoption social worker is or the the AAP contact. And so, what would you recommend to them? How can they um, how can they get in touch with their adoption social worker, their post adoption social worker? Okay, so typically counties will not assign um, AAP cases to a specific worker. Um, generally, it's best if parents can contact con contact the county or the department and ask to speak with post adoption services, and that will they'll um, then probably talk to the worker of the day, and who will help. Um, who will take their call and then refer them to the appropriate contact within the county. Um, they're also welcome to send an email to um, our AAP mailbox and we can help, you know, if they just provide the name of the county who sends them and checks, then we can um, provide them the appropriate contact information as well. Okay. Is the AAP mailbox AAP at dss.ca.gov or is it? Correct. Of... Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll type it in right now. Okay. So. Perfect. Well, just uh, just to let everybody know, um, Marta and Olga are with the Adoption Services Branch, not the Adoptions Policy Unit. Just wanted to clarify that. That's all right. <laughs> it's all incomes and all adoptions. <laughs> right. All righty. So next up, I believe we are going to have our last speaker, which is Whitney Robertson from Think of Us. Are you there, Whitney? I am here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can loud and clear. I'm awesome. going to go ahead and give you the floor. Go ahead and take it away. Thank you. Of course, it's telling me I need to open my system preferences. Let me give it access. 
All right, let's see if I can share. Um, I am so sorry. Hmm. Tremaine, it's saying that I have to hop out and hop back in since I updated the preferences. Is that okay? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Not a I problem. Think, and I do think a call in user raised their hand. So I'm not sure if um, someone has a question. Okay, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and get out. to the. Let me go ahead and mute them and see what they would like to say while All you right. do that. Existing preference. I sent them a request to unmute, so I'm not sure if they're going to receive it as a call-in user, how that even works. All right. All right, Whitney is back. Take it away. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I told you. Oh, I'm no, you are totally fine. Saying. Don't worry about it. <laughs> My computer fails me. All right, are you seeing um, the deck? Yes. Awesome. So, hi everyone, I am Whitney Robertson. I'm a director of programs uh, at Think of Us, and I'm gonna go over our virtual support services that is offered to adoptive, adoptive California, kin, oh, excuse me, adopt, adoptive caregivers. Sorry, it is like six o'clock my time, and I start losing my words. Um, and talk about what we do and how you can access it. Just a real quick overview of Think of Us as an organization. Um, our vision is a world where every person has the conditions that they need to heal, develop, and thrive. Um, and our, our mission here at Think of Us is that we're actually a research and design lab for child welfare, driving systems change so that youth and families and caregivers like yourselves uh, who are most impacted by the system have the greatest power and opportunity to reshape it. Um, and so one of the things uh, in virtual support services and think of us as a whole too, um, that we have, have found through our data is that not only um, do our young people transitioning out of foster care uh, struggle to have the resources uh, to meet their needs, but so do our caregivers. Um, and we've seen it across all populations that we serve, including kinship caregivers and adoptive caregivers, that the top needs are basic needs. Um, and accessing those can be very complex, uh, sometimes defeating, uh, and requiring a lot of manual navigation on the caregiver young person's part, long wait times, dependency on professional gatekeepers, and then limited by what local resources actually do exist. And so we uh, have virtual support services, which you may hear me refer to it as VSS. Um, it's a resource navigation model that we, where we use tech enabled strategies to give both young people and caregivers direct access to resources and create a clearer pathway to meet basic needs. And so how do we do that? Um, some of the things that, uh, you can expect if you're an adoptive caregiver, caregiver, young person who needs support, access, and resources. Um, we're radically transactional. So we're not a long term service. Uh, you make a request and you get what you came for as soon as possible. Our community responders are who you will be talking and working with. Um, and their goal is to take as much of that grunt work off of you um, and off of your plate and have your request resolved within two weeks on average. And what we see uh, in California for our caregivers, it's typically within seven days. Um, we have and strive for incredible customer service. Uh, so our community, community responders are unfailingly polite, respond quickly to you and keep following up until you are satisfied and you have what you need um, resource-wise, service-wise, um, to meet the needs that you came in for. Low wait times, um, 
oftentimes we've seen just for resources in general, there can be wait times to get calls back to see if they even have capacity to serve. Um, our goal is to, we promise to respond within 72 hours. Um, and for the majority of the time, our community responders respond within eight business hours. Uh, we have grassroots knowledge and partnerships. Uh, so when our community responders are not helping uh, our help seekers or caregivers, young people directly, they are vetting resources throughout your community. So throughout California, where we're seeing the most um, needs to get you access to the less common, more local resources. And when we say taking off the grunt work, that means all of those applications or pulling together documents and having to get it to this person, and then you might have to send something else to this person. That's what our community responders can do for you. Um, we can fill out applications for you. We find out uh, before giving you a resource, we vetted it to make sure that it's gonna meet your need, that they don't have long wait times. Um, they actually go through it as if they were a caregiver themselves, just to kind of test out what's the what's the customer service like um, with this resource. And if you know they're not up to standard for our criteria, um, that we don't include them and utilize them as a resource because we don't want to be sending uh, our help seekers to resources that just aren't helpful or quick turnaround times. Uh, something unique about us, we also have non-traditional resource partnerships. And so um, we have digital uh, partner collaborative where we leverage technology in a sense with different partners who kind of live in the digital space, whether it's One Simple Wish, um, we've partnered with University of California, San Francisco telehealth program and M relief. And so this enables us to be able to support getting you what you need quickly, especially where there's resource deserts. So maybe, um, you know, it's difficult. Maybe you live in a rural area and transportation to the social services office to apply for SNAP benefits is very difficult to obtain. We've got a partnership with M relief um, where we can literally do a text application within five minutes using their service um, and going through that process of applying for SNAP benefits, knowing whether you're eligible for it or not and submitting all documentation virtually um, versus having that burden of trying to figure out transportation. So when I'm saying leveraging different virtual uh, partnerships, that's just one example. And so this kind of goes into more detail about our partner, our digital collaborative, which is in our partner collaborative. So we bring together organizations that are committed to leveraging their current infrastructure, which is typically in the virtual world, um, influence and resources and service of people with lived experience in foster care or as caregivers um, through our partner collaborative. And these are just some different ones that we partner with and to become a partner. Our caregivers and young people test it out. They test their, their service. They give uh, feedback. We've got constant feedback loops um, and we're able to get uh, customer satisfaction surveys to make sure that these partners are good partners and our help seekers are getting what they need through them. So how does all this work? Um, so caregivers and young people can access and navigate our virtual support services website. It's via website. There's also a phone number uh, that you can call in if for some reason, you know, you accessing a website may, uh, may not be accessible to you. Uh, you. You can request direct support from a community responder who can respond via your preferred uh, communication method. So we're able to speak through email, text, video, or phone call. Um, you can also navigate on your own uh, on our website with personalized resources being recommended. And then you can access our non-traditional resources within the partner collaborative. And so the last thing I'll do, um, I will drop our uh, website in the chat and send it out. But I just want you to be able to see, um, you know, how to access our website. So this is our website. Um, just to note, we did do this in partnership with CDSS, the California Department of Social Services. We are the Kinship Navigator Program, but we are able to serve 
um, young people and adoptive caregivers as well. And so up here, you know, you can access it in English. If you would like it in Spanish, you can click at the top right, but you can search for resources near you on your own, or you can click request support and talk to someone. And I'll just show you real quick a demo if I were to search for resources on my own. So you're going to choose your profile, adopted parent. Let's say I live in 90017 zip code and I'm looking for food. And so what it's going to do is pull up from our back end. Um, if it's got a yellow verified resource, it means that it was vetted by one of our community responders. And this is some a resource that we utilize with our adoptive caregivers often and have good success. But it'll give you different options um, for emergency food, food pantries. It's going to give you the locations, food banks, um, different delivery services. But let's say that, you know, you don't really want to do this. Let's let the community responder take that off your hands. Um, you can click request support. And then again, you get to choose whatever's best for you. If you want to talk by a phone call, email, or text, um, let's say we want to call with a personal assistant. If you'd like to just call versus using the website, this is the number that's going to get you directly in touch with a community responder. Um, but if you'd like to schedule one, I'll just show you real quick the process and what to expect to uh, information to provide. So we've got name, preferred pronouns, email. I'm going to type in my number and then zip code where I currently live. Or if you are in a uh, if you're already in California, you can click detect my location and it can detect your, um, <clears throat> your, your zip code. And then how old is a person who needs the resource? Um, this could be you as a caregiver. It could be one of your young people that um, you're trying to connect a resource to, such as like mental health support, um, school support, anything like that. So let's just say I'm 33. I'm an adoptive parent. And then choose up to three things that you might need assistance with. Um, so let's say I need some clothing, supplies, and food. And then it's going to ask you to rate for your clothing and supplies. What, how, uh, how concerned are you about this need? So let's say for clothing and supplies, I need some help. But for food, I need lots of help. And then anything else we should know, um, that's optional. But once you fill this short form out, you submit a book and call, um, excuse me, submit and book a call um, with a community responder or submit and call now. Um, and so all of this will go to our community responder team and then they will reach out to you by phone call directly, um, typically again, like within eight business hours. I am going to stop sharing so I can see everyone. But are there any questions? I know that's a lot of information at once. I can also drop my email in the chat and then our website. And Tremaine, I'll be able to send this information to all attendees or to you to, who can provide this information to our attendees today. Yes, you can definitely send it to me. And I can't see if there's questions, so if there are, let me know. Jen, do you happen to see any questions out there for Whitney? We do not see any questions. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Whitney, for that information today. 
Um, we are nearing the end of our webinar for today, which is post adoption support. Uh, Jen, is there anything that you would like to add? I would just like to add that I'm, I hope that adoptive families will um, reach out to these um, partners and programs and, um, and ask for help. Um, and we know that this, the past few years have been particularly hard on families and a lot of our youth are needing um, extra support at this time, especially in school and with behavioral health services. Uh, a lot of the count, a lot of programs are based in in uh, counties, so calling the county um, twenty four hour um, mental health um, service access line is is always an option, um, and um, we we encourage families to advocate for themselves and their youth and keep asking until they get the services and support that they need. So I'm I'm encouraging everyone to reach out to one of these partners um, and to continue um, reaching out and asking questions until um, the needs of your youth and family are met. And thank you to all of the speakers who've, who've brought this information together for families. I think it's really helpful. Perfect. Well, thank you so much everyone for joining us today. Thank you to all of our speakers. Thank you to CAC, California Alliance of Caregivers. Um, this is going to conclude our webinar for today. Our next webinar is scheduled for next month. Again, um, thank you to everyone for your information today and everybody have a great day. Thanks everyone. Bye.